Welcome. <coughs> this is uh, 10 questions with Alec Baldwin. If you're familiar with the process, 10 questions is a page in the magazine with reader submitted questions that are gathered from time.com. For Alec, we got about 160 something questions. We're asking each and every one of them. <laughs> okay. So get comfortable. Um, I'll give you one word answers. <laughs> you can try. You can try. Posted by Catherine Thompson in New York. What do you think of Tina Fey's impression of Sarah Palin? But I couldn't believe it. I thought that they nailed it. I can see Russia from my house. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was like, oh my God. It was so perfect. You know, she, really is, she really is an incredible actress. The more she goes out there on the ice, I think the better for her because she can do just about anything. She's funny. Scott Jorna in London. Are Jack Donaghy and Liz Lemon going to hook up? I, yeah, I, I wondered about this question. Well, if they do, yeah. I hope they read my book, A Promise <laughs> to Ourselves, about the pitfalls of uh, high-conflict divorce. Um, uh, no, the, um, uh, no, they're not going to hook up. You always find, I, I was told, the formula is um, that it's better when they don't. Like, like p keep people wanting them to hook up, because then once they do, the tension is gone. But there, I mean, to be, to be fair, there is also the issue there's a little age difference too, right? Strange. And? No, okay, yeah, no. So? No, you're right, that wouldn't be a problem at all. Uh, um, Rupert Murdoch, I mean, come on. <laughs> right down the block, I mean. Am I in the wrong building, by the way? <laughs> Glengarry Glen Ross, Notting Hill, The Departed. You sort of, you just come on and you attack what's going on there, and you are an agent of change within the movie. And uh, it's Mauricio Beltran in Chicago asked a question that I think goes to that, which is, your self-confidence is almost intimidating. Do you make a conscious effort to project it? Does it come naturally? Well, I think that when you play, that's not naturally who I am, mm -hmm. you know? Like me, who I am, I'm sitting here going, oh God, what am I doing here? With all these people from Time Magazine, what are they thinking? You know, you have a natural amount of uh, insecurity that people have. But as an actor, you have a job to do. You know, you have a job to do. And if the character you play is uh, the negative value in the piece, you're the bad guy, and you've got you've to give it to the leading actor the best you can, because it's all the more satisfying that that person is vanquished. You know, the, the Alan Rickman school, you know, of villainy, <laughs> where you play as this like, supremely confident and capable and facile person, so that when they stab him in the end of the movie, you're going, oh yeah, stab him again. <laughs> you know? And uh, I mean, I played parts in films that nobody saw. You know, movies, you, you play, you'd play parts that are very vulnerable parts or very against the grain of what you've done, and people never see those movies. They don't, they don't know that about you. They don't see that about you. But I, I understand what you're saying, where people think, I'm, I'm always the guy that comes in the room and straightens everybody out. You know, you feel like you're patent. You're like slapping the guy in the tent. <laughs> and telling everybody what they got to do. But I don't think all the films I've made have been that way. Let's move into the fish in the barrel portion of this interview with politics. Um, what are your impressions? Fish in the barrel for you, you mean? Well, no, well, I don't know. We'll see who's got the gun. Oh, here we go. Uh, what are your impressions of each candidate in the current presidential campaign? Well, there's, a, I mean, there's obviously so much surface area that you can cover there. The thing that concerns me is that, and I've got to get the exact name of the bill, but, you know, McCain voted against the Equal Pay for Women bill. And he's got a woman as a running mate who is his running mate, running mate only because she is a woman. McCain chose her to try to rake all the discontented Hillaryites into a pile, and he thought that they, in, a, in, a, in a tight race, in a critical race, uh, that might rule the day. That might make it, especially in you know, these kind of states that are in play. And uh, she doesn't think or speak or act politically like any woman I know in the modern world. And the other thing I was mentioning to my friend is that, you know, to me, you see a sea of people at the Republican Convention with signs that say country first. And I would like to get a definition of what that means from them specifically. But I'd also like to think, do they think that the financial markets in this country should put their country first? Do they think that Wall Street should put their country first? Because Wall Street and the financial markets have not put their country first. And we're all in a lot of trouble because of the way these people behaved and because of deregulation on Wall Street. What increased regulation would McCain support? And in terms of country first, what does John McCain think Wall Street and the financial market should do to put their country first? I would be dying to hear him answer that question. So, okay, I think I can divine a political affiliation. <laughs> um, the phone message that you left for your daughter Ireland was widely publicized. How has it affected you in the eyes of the public, and would you do things differently if you had another chance? Uh, 
I mean, there's a lot of things I can say about that, but it's safe to say I'd never done that in my life before. I mean, I really, really it was just so, and the book talks about the way I've been treated, the way that this has been dealt with, me being inside of a system where there was never any acknowledgement of my rights as a father, none. You get into a divorce and you're in this Lewis Carroll world where everything, you know, north is south, up is down, black is white, everything is renounced, everything is for the purposes of this kind of gladiatorial combat. So I had been living with this for seven years. I mean, you're talking to somebody who was conciliatory with a capital C for seven years. And it, it gained me no ground. Everything stayed as black and as bad and as uncooperative and as destructive and as personal as it could be for seven years. So then I left that voicemail message, which obviously, as most people would deduce, I was really speaking to someone else on that voicemail and took it out on someone else. What was the <coughs> reaction of just walking around, I mean, in the days after that? Well, we live in a world where... I believe that because people are so removed from the democratic process in this country, and this is an opinion, because people's voice matters so little in politics and in government, they have transferred that energy. It's got to go somewhere. So it's been transferred over to American Idol and the Internet and chat rooms where you say, Alec Baldwin is an asshole. <laughs> Mike Bloomberg wants to upend term limits. Alec Baldwin is an asshole. <laughs> I mean, to me, go to the AOL homepage. You go to the AOL homepage, and all you see on the AOL homepage is pictures of, fat pictures of this actress. Click here. This actor screamed at his wife. Click here. I mean, there's nothing more disgraceful than the AOL homepage. <laughs> because, 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 well, because it's AOL, and you figure it's this estimable... Reason, you know, it's not page six, but in the end, in the, AOL, <clears throat> the AOL homepage is really like page six. Jennifer Love Hewitt's chubby thighs, click here. <laughs> that's on the AOL homepage, and there's like reams of it. And you realize that that's where people have decided to put their, uh, uh, their uh, opinion-driven energy. And so as a result of that, I mean, I gave them a smorgasbord, you know, with th that event. And I had to live with that for a long, long time. Catherine Pilly in Covington, Louisiana. Would you ever get married again? Oh, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> I need my pill. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, well, listen, I think that, um, of course, divorce uh, makes you know, it, it eclipses your real feelings about marriage. And I think marriage is great. My brother Billy, he's got the happiest family. His kids are great. He loves his wife. But even he leans over to me one time about a couple of years ago and goes, what I wouldn't give to be you for a month. <laughs> <laughs> Do I ever think I'll get married again? I don't know. I'm older now. I'm 50. You know, meeting somebody and getting married, it's tough, uh, you, know, to, you know, with my lifestyle. Sally Verno, Williamson, New York. Which one of the Baldwin brothers is your favorite? <laughs> I know my answer. Um, uh, well, in my family, it changes uh, on like a six-month cycle. <laughs> um, we all pick one member of our family, and we all trash that person. We all call each other and say, don't you just hate when he does that? And Haven't you always hated him? <laughs> and then it rotates, like the tides, you know what I mean? And then, it, then it's your turn. Then they don't call me for six months, and you can hear them. Don't you just hate him? <laughs> you know? So I would say right now, my favorite... Uh, Baldwin brother is probably uh, <laughs> uh, my brother Daniel. Yeah, I'm very hopeful because he's had a lot of problems in his life and his drug addiction and so forth. So I'm very uh, keen on helping him to finally find a way. Luke Watson, what is it like to have really awesome hair? <laughs> I'm glad what's, he it, what's asked his name? Uh, Luke Watson. Luke. Well, Luke, let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> Comes in handy, Luke, in a lot of situations. <laughs> I, uh, that's the only thing I have, you know, at my age. I, still, <laughs> I have my hair, man. I'm 50, but I got my hair. So, yeah. I'm here in Stanley Tucci's not. So. Right, exactly. No, no, come on now. <laughs> AOL homepage, come on. 